Hi guys, this is Abhirubdha. I hope you're having a good time at the Pune International Lit Fest. Thank you, Manjiri Prabhu. Thank you, Suhail Mathur from the Book Bakers. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Westland Books. I'm here to talk about Ghost and Gaurav Tiwari, which is about Reverend Gaurav Tiwari, who was the pioneer of paranormal investigation in India. He founded Indian Paranormal Society in 2009. This is about the life and legacy of the man himself. Uh, it touches upon his mysterious death, but it's mostly about him and the wonderful work he did. And the most spine chilling cases of Indian Paranormal Society have been curated in this Once in a Blue Moon tribute to horror. So I recommend you to read this book if you haven't yet. Have a good time at the Pune International Lit Fest. And thank you for having us. Thank you for watching us. My name is Meghna from Indian Paranormal Society. First of all, I would like to thank the Pune International Literary Festival for honoring us and showcasing our book, uh, Ghost Hunter God of Tiwari at the, at the Literary Festival. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about what the book is about. It's about uh, the pioneer of uh, paranormal in India, Reverend Gaurav Tiwari. He bought paranormal in India in 2009 when he formed Indian Paranormal Society. And this book uh, showcases his life, his legacy, how a, he became a believer from a non-believer and some of the most intriguing cases that he's done in India and, and uh, all over the world. So we would like, I would like to thank uh, Indian Paranormal Society, would like to thank uh, Westland Publications for publishing this book. Our literary agent, uh, Suhail Mathur, along with his team, the Book Bakers Club, uh, sorry, the Book Bakers, and uh, of course, Abhirubdhar, who has done a fantastic job of writing this book with us. Uh, if you have not already bought this book, please go ahead and buy it and read it. And if you have bought this book, but it's lying on your desk, pick it up and start reading. This is one of the best books that you will ever read. And if you don't know things about Gaurav Tiwari, this is a book that you need to start reading. Thank you so much for making us a part of the Pune International Liter Literary Festival. I wish you all the very, uh, very luck there. Thank you. Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright with Miss Ambika Ayadurai, Mr. Babi Nobis, and Ms. Tina Nobis. The discussion will be led by Ms. Harini Nagedra. Ambika Ayadurai is an assistant professor, anthropology in Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. She is an anthropologist of wildlife conservation with a special interest in human animal relations and community based conversation projects. Her ongoing and long term research aims to understand how local and global forces shape human animal relations. Her monograph, Tigers Are Our Brothers, Anthropology of Wildlife Conservation in Northeast India, published by Oxford University Press, UK, 2021. Babi Nobis. Over the last 30 years, Babi Nobis has explored the incredible wilderness of both the Indian and African wildlife reserves. His long-standing passion for wildlife and the big cats in particular resulted in an inspiring portfolio of photographs that eventually culminated in the publishing of his first pictorial on Sapphire, the tiger and the baobab tree. Bobby is a founder member of WPSI, Wildlife Protection Society of India, whose main aim has been to draw focus to the ongoing daunting task of tackling India's wildlife crisis, in particular poaching and the illegal trade of India's wild tigers. Tina Nobis, an inherently creative person dabbling in different forms of art. Tina Nobis is a textile designer and ceramic sculptor. She spent her growing up years close to nature and had the privilege of playing with the tiger cubs as well as of being in close proximity with a pet tigress in her childhood. 
Passionate about being in the jungle, she has traveled extensively with her husband, Bobby, to different wildlife areas around the world. Harini Nagendra is professor and lead Center for Climate Change and Sustain Sustainability at Azim Premji University. Over the past 25 years, she has been at the leading edge of research examining conservation in forests and cities of South Asia from the perspective of both landscape ecology and social justice. She is recipient of several research awards. She is the author of Nature in the City, Bengaluru in the Past, Present and Future, and is a well-known public speaker and writer on issues of urban sustainability in India. I request Ms. Harini Nagendra to lead the discussion. Uh, a big thank you. I hope you can all hear me. A big thank you to Pune Lit Fest for organizing this. I think uh, on behalf of uh, India's conservation issues, we all thank you because it is time for uh, issues of conservation, which are so important to India to get mainstreamed, I think, into all our conversations around writing, around communication, and in, indeed into Lit Fest. So it's very nice to see that the Pune Lit Fest has this entire session on tigers. Uh, personally, it's a delight to be here. I have not met uh, either Rambika or Tina or Bhavi, and we're doing this virtually from four states across India. So I think it's also a tribute to the lockdown and uh, the, the creativity of um, our capacity to cope with moving online that actually these kinds of things are possible with a relatively low carbon footprint, which is also good for the tigers, of course, so that, you know, that we can be in these different places and still do this. And... Uh, what the, the format we will follow is that uh, for the, so just for those of you who are dialing in as an audience, that for the next about 40 minutes or so, we will have a few, con um, I'll pose a few questions to the uh, authors and we will have this quick conversation round table. And then the last 15 minutes, we would have time to take questions from you. So please start posting in your questions online and uh, then we can make sure we take them in. And if a lot of questions come in, there's even a possibility that we can weave more questions in. So please do make this interactive. We would love to hear your comments and questions this from the audience. So I'll start with the fact that I was especially delighted when the organizers reached out to me as well as the publishers of the books, because um, the conservation community in India is often extremely polarized, shall we say, between people who look at wildlife specific, people who look at human rights, people who look at indigenous communities, then there is, um, you know, government actors, then there are private conservationists. So there's a, a number of groups in India. And uh, having looked at uh, conservation issues myself from 1992 or thereabouts, which is close, so we're getting close to 30 years of experience now. I think everyone in this group will uh, agree with me that it's, it is a very important issue, conservation in India. And but it's an issue that we are not really able to take forward because each group has its different take on it. And of course, one one hour session is not going to solve our problems. But I would like to hear from this con uh, this entire conversation that we have, how each of us have come to e to these problems. So that's, I guess, my first question. And maybe I'll pose it to first to Bobby, then to Tina, then to Ambika in that order. Of how did you come to this to this fascination? For so for Bobby and Tina, I guess, how would it? How did you come to this con? Uh, to this issue of cats, what brought you to this? What brought you to do what you do? And then I will next ask you about the books. So please don't tell the audience so much about the books first. But I just want to know what brought you here. And Ambika, similarly, because you have a very interesting background of wildlife conservation and then moving to anthropology. So what brought you here? So could I start with Babi first? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Well, your question was, why the fascination with, with with great cats, right? With the big cats. Yes, and also what brought you here? I think there are a lot of younger people listening to this who might think that they grew up in cities or may not have. So I just want to know how different people came to this journey so that they can also see if they have paths that can bring them similarly into these kinds of areas. No, I grew up in, in a city. I grew up in Calcutta. But uh, a lot of my childhood holidays, summer holidays in school, were spent up in Assam, where I am originally from. My parents were both from Assam, and I had the exposure to visit tea gardens and tiger reserves, etc., etc., and also the brilliant experience of running into a wild tiger at night 
when I was a youngster, maybe 11 years old or something like that, on foot, my mistake of wandering around in the, in the forest at night. But there it was. And it uh, because of that, I've had this fascination with the tiger. And of the four large, great cats, the jaguar, the tiger, the lion, and the leopard, though we've been to the Amazon, I was never, I, I, I've not be, uh, I never saw uh, a jaguar over there at all, though we tried very hard. So I spent the time photographing um, tigers, of course, in India and Nepal, and uh, leopards in India, in Sri Lanka, and Africa, and lion in Africa. But my fascination has always been with primarily with the tiger and the leopard, which I find a very fascinating creature because of its ability to climb up and down trees, and uh, is an elusive elusive spotted cat, put it that way. So that's basically the rundown to my interest in tiger photography. And then in 1990, we were in Africa in the Mara and the Serengeti. And that exposure was well, the first time we'd been to Africa 30 years ago. And that, that I found fascinating ever since we've been back, well, ever so often, almost every year, into different parts, right from Botswana, Rwanda, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Tanzania, eight of these countries, photographing, spending time. That is. If I could give, have a quick follow up, uh, because 30 years is a long time to, do, to be doing this. How, and now I'm sure a lot of this is digital. But before, when you started, how it must have been a very different world and very difficult to take equipment, not so easy to get into the forest, move around. So, how have things changed? See, uh, I stayed as long as I could with emulsion film. Uh, I was never keen not to go digital. Around 2008, I think, I was compelled to, not for anything else, the processing of film, emulsion, became harder and harder. But the prim primary difficulty in shooting emulsion, I'll give you an example, actually, what happened. I was uh, in the emulsion day, I was photographing two bull hippos fighting. And whenever I, I bought emulsion film, I'd take, let's say, 30, 40 rolls with me. I'd take it out of the canister. I'd, I'd pick up the slack on, on, the, on the film. And I'd keep them. I, I could reload a film camera, which gives about 37, 38 exposures. I could re reload it as fast as any human being in the world could do it. But it wasn't <laughs> good enough for that interim period when hippos are fighting. And when you're ch changing over, even if you've got two cameras, but you've got different film speeds, you got different um, uh, focal length and lenses. So and that is the slack, which is, that is where digital has come in. You know, there are no gaps. It's continuous photography. But in emulsion, you, and you're in your rapid firing when you're shooting, it takes no time to finish 37, 38 emulsion strips, 36 by 24 millimeter. So the changeover happened in the mid, late 2008, 2007. And now the digital cameras, the high-end ones are very refined. You know, though I, I mean, if you if you look at pictures, the the softness in certain transparencies, digital is coming close, but digital hasn't surpassed the best low ISO films. You know, ASA, you know, the 50 ASA, Fuji Velvia, and film like that. I, they're coming close. But uh, I'd still give emulsion a little more than than digital. Right. Thanks. This is this. I think this glimpse into long history of of wildlife photography is fascinating. Tina, I, I'm sure you came in from a very different route. So could you tell us well, your? I grew up in a very small town. I grew up in Bhubaneswar, in a very small town. The years we were growing up, the biggest form of entertainment was to get into a car and go spotting for wildlife, whatever we could find, rabbits, deer, anything like that. That was the big thing. Playing with tiger cubs was uh, was really a privilege because it's a small town. You knew everybody. When the, when the, and we were right next to Nandan Kanan, which everybody I'm sure has heard of. It was one of the largest um, open air zoo kind of things. So whenever there were cubs born, that was what we were invited to go play with them. You know, parents knew uh, the, the director there. So you went and you, so it became very part of growing up, you know, playing with tiger cubs, when has the next litter coming, this kind of thing. 
uh, also this whole fact that I met Khairi, which was this pet tigress uh, brought up. And you know, you went and you could sit with her in the same room and pat her. And how is it not possible to be fascinated by the tiger? I mean, really, it is the most royal. Uh, it's, it is so obvious, I think. Most people would do that. You know, I, 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 I try and understand people who say, uh, who are bird watchers, or who look at an otter and of course great respect for all wildlife but the tiger is in another league so uh, the and, and i i am completely with my husband on that and the cats for that matter and you asked him a question about equipment uh, for years i just tried to be his handy woman help him carry uh, you know and he would never never let anybody carry his lenses uh, very quickly we were in the masai mara we were on a hot air balloon and the balloon kind of crashed. Everyone hung onto the balloon for dear life. My husband was the only one who was hanging onto both the lenses like that, you know, to help with anything else. So uh, that has been a great part of being with him. And then I started doing video photography. So on, well, you said not to say, but that's what we have even tried to put in our book. So that's been my journey. And I'm very glad I met somebody like this who was completely, you know, uh, our first holiday after we got married was to Tana National Park, you know, so th that's how it has been. That's great. That's great. And I'm because I want to add, I want to add in one thing. And I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. The tiger is the ultimate superstar. You know, he's the ultimate superstar. I mean, I've seen in 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 India, in Madhya Pradesh, and other places, you see the world coming in with the huge 600 millimeter lenses only for the tiger. You do not. See that the ultimate superstar. The, ultimate, the, 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 the fascination with, with, the, with the tiger is something unbelievable. It's un so the, the magnificence of that of that of that big cat of that great cat is something that in your lifetime you have to see a big male even cat. even people who, who live in the jungles when they see a tiger, the guides, the drivers, the locals, they stop. They stop yeah, and there see. is admiration and awe even they nobody yeah. can yeah i think you've given me the perfect timing to also hand over to ambika because when you said the yes. locals i think yes. book is so much about uh, local Absolutely. people living with the tiger as opposed to people who come to see the tiger who are in landscape which don't normally encounter the tiger so i think this is a, a real interesting contrast but before that i will ask you ambika what makes a wildlife, uh, someone trained in wildlife biology move to anthropology? Because to me, that is one of the most fascinating parts of your book. We rarely find people who do this journey. We Again, I'm talking about camps of people and we have different communities. And so you, your transition, what shaped this transition? And bef see, um, before that, again, as academics, you and I, I think we're... See, if we're talking to an audience who doesn't understand really the difference between what is a wildlife conservationist and what an anthropologist is, if you could also do a little bit of an introduction to what these different communities are, why they're so disappearing different, and why this the transition you've done is so unusual yeah. in some sense. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Ambika, uh, I think you need to unmute or something. No. We are in four different places. And pull it out, maybe? No. Can you try pulling out your mic from the computer and just speak directly into the computer? No, you'll have to. Have you pulled out the plug also, the connection? Uh, no. You heard her a little while ago. Okay. Okay, I'm just trying to see if the audience can. Uh, I mean, are there tech people here that can help us? Mm -hmm. 
Ambika, could you try dialing in from a different device, maybe? Or logging out and restarting? OK. Maybe while we get uh, uh, Tina and Bobby, would you like to tell us about the book while we're getting Ambika back? Um, well, this is Bobby's second book. And uh, I think she's back. Is she back? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, and uh, can you hear me now? Uh, coming and going. Uh, yeah. Uh, having, having, yeah. Uh, so I was because the connection is very bad. I'm in the I'm in Roying, Arunachal Pradesh. And, uh, we can hear you. Can I continue? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Shall I continue? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay. No, I was telling that Arunachal Pradesh, I should give credit to my visit to Arunachal Pradesh, which was instrumental in changing my discipline. I, I came to Arunachal Pradesh uh, uh, not to study tigers. And uh, so I came as a wildlife biologist. I think my interest in wildlife was from an academic point of view. From a, you know, I, I did my uh, bachelor's in zoology. I took a standard, you know, con you know nothing very fancy. A science graduate did zoology. And after that, my training in Wildlife Institute of India, and uh, and then subsequent visit uh, doing a project on human animal conflict in Arunachal Pradesh. So I came to Arunachal Pradesh to do a survey on human animal conflict, and I what I was doing is anthropology without getting trained in anthropology, and I that side I do working with people, understanding how communities live with animals was, was very fascinating. And I realized that as a formally trained wildlife biologist, I was not trained in social science. But when I was pushed to uh, do a survey in Arunachal Pradesh, and I, I think I, my training in our anthropology started before formal uh, uh, training in anthropology. The shift, the shift was mainly because of my work in, uh, in Arunachal Pradesh. And tigers came into my, I never wanted to work on tigers, unlike, you know, uh, Oh, fascinating! I was listening to Bobby and uh, and Tina. I know to work on uh, tigers. I wanted to look at uh, different groups of people who are interested in conservation, as Harini was mentioning. And uh, during my visit to Arunachal Pradesh, people were uh, talking about tiger cubs from uh, the Bang Valley. I think the information from people got fascinated, uh, you know, me to study tigers and not me as a person who was fascinated with the tigers. I, I look at the tiger in a very, uh, uh, you know, not in a very romantic way as, you know, as my colleagues here do that because I 
because of my training and uh, and then for me like the conservation the actors who are involved in tiger conservation is the is are I'm, i'm asking very academic questions about what is happening in the name of tiger conservation the approaches to tiger conservation and that's what is about and uh, what harin is asking is how, what is the main difference between the discipline the disciplinary approach the main disciplinary approach would be uh, as a wildlife conservationist or as a wildlife biologist we are more most interested from the interested to know know the ecological aspects of the biological aspects of tigers you know about, about tiger habitat about tiger numbers etc as an anthropologist i am actually moving away from tigers and also including people in it as an as an anthropologist i study human societies and principally i'm looking in that how do local communities and western tigers because as a, as as children i always knew we we know tigers as national animals we have written a lot of essays in school about write 10 lines about tigers and we always write that tiger is a national animal we never study when i was doing surveys in arunachal pradesh people would always say that tiger hamara bhai hai in hindi you know and that was very interesting as so nobody told that to me to look to understanding of how about the uh, local uh, ecosystem and landscape is very fascinating and here thanks people say yes. that there are kin there are there are there are a sibling so that is a very interesting uh, relation which i thought should be explored uh, because otherwise uh, tiger conservation from a science perspective uh, the we don't have space to accommodate local perspectives and that's what i'm trying to do in the in the absolutely book. yeah can we have thanks. multiple so, yeah, perspectives I, about how do we understand tigers of course tigers are a fascinating animal superstars but they are also super brothers according to according to the indo mishmi and the local community absolutely. i think i think this Most is this is fascinating local so yeah very fascinating if i can just get in the space for that yeah uh, before this local natives disappear from the uh, from, from the memories and so this is what i did in the book uh, bringing in local perspectives about human animal relationships absolutely i think this is so that's why for me this is a very interesting uh, uh, panel that brings all of this together so yeah uh, if i can then quickly then i think because we we are at 2:15 and i want to make sure i give both of you time to i mean all three of you time to talk about the book i think this is very fascinating so it's different perspectives super let's say superstars and super brothers i think i uh, this is uh, that's a good that's a good title i think that's, that's a great title. Title. good title for the panel exactly good title yes Absolutely. so thank you thanks abika for a very fascinating description and uh, now if i can turn it over quickly to you both uh, tina and uh, babi to tell the audience about the book so our new book babi's new book primarily i have just written the text from uh, it's exactly the way i've seen it the text is written the way i've seen it and because i take videos i've managed to put in some videos in the book uh, there are 20 videos that are extensions of the photographs i'm going to quickly show you the book we haven't had time to put in the slide but this is the book this is the book and uh, um, we have a, a forward by jonathan and angela scott who are the big cat people from africa 
and also uh, knows so much about the big cats. And the book is is primarily on tigers, lions, um, leopards, and uh, uh, because Barbie's pet subject like that. I don't know if I can show you any of the pictures, but that is how the book looks in the beginning. And the pictures, uh, if I may say so, have uh, been able, Bobby has been able to depict a lot of the action. He has an extremely keen eye, even though I have seen it at close hand, and uh, he's able to catch the mood and the essence. So I think what he's really, or we are trying to convey is everybody knows the tiger. Everybody sees the tiger. And today with so much in uh, information and uh, National Geographic and Animal Planet and all these channels. It's really in your homes today. You don't have to get into a jeep out and go on a safari. But he's been able, to, so we would like you to see these animals through our eyes, through his eyes and catch the essence of what it is and and the stories that follow it. Uh, I like the fact that Chihuahua's tigers are our brothers because there's been so much, we have tigers in mythology, we have tigers for years everywhere everywhere and i think uh, the forest people as i see it are are have been the innocence they are now they are now being subjected to and impregnated with a lot of city life it's not the old civilization and you know that they were i think the whole it's a very interesting thing i would like to hear from Ambika about how the whole tiger brother story is patching up but so I mean, I don't know if I can if I can show you, Bobby. Would you like to add something about the book? Well, um, the book has also over two hundred photographs, of which a number of them are sequence photographs of an activity, like tiger cubs swimming in the water or lions fighting in South Africa. And Tina has been in the same vehicle as me all in all all ninety nine point nine percent of these trips, and she's. Short high definition video all through. If you're seeing, let's say, in Tabula, tiger cubs playing in the water, I, 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 I show you six stills. And uh, she shows you the video uh, through the QR code, which is in the book. So the, it all comes to life. So what you're seeing on paper is on your phone. And it brings the book to life. I find that fascinating because I've never seen it in any other book anywhere in the world. So I think uh, it, it's it's worth seeing because of the QR code. And Tina has written the text. <laughs> I don't say so. It's a, it's a great read. Not only in this book, in the book also, but in this book definitely too. I'll show you one picture. I think it's just quite fascinating. I don't know if anyone can see it. But these are like two gladiators uh, that are, that, you know, the two tigers that are fighting. But I was not with Bobby at this time. I was making breakfast in our jungle. So I have no way to And like I said, I'm never happy. But if, you know, I'm very jealous of a tiger fighting. Very, very jealous, even today. It's never enough. It's never well, enough. Just, I wasn't I there. So. You know, with me for this particular sequence, but I was there with some friends, yeah. and uh, my driver spotted this tiger about 80, 90 yards across uh, an Allah. And uh, he said it's one of the full size Patia cubs. About time for them to yeah. leave their mother. There was a male and a female. He says, Wait, the male will come also. That was the female. So I, re I reset my camera setting, expecting some action. Because I know the mom fight at all. And sure enough, in 10 minutes' time, the male came flying out, and the female was prepared for that. You see them up like boxers, you know, the claws are out, mind you, you know, the, the shot of the 600 prime length. You can see the clarity, the claws picked up at 100 yards, say 80, 90 yards, whatever. And this whole thing, if you did not anticipate something like this is going to happen, you could never have frozen those pictures. The whole thing was over in two seconds. So you're expecting right. something to happen. The minute it happens, you rapid fire. It's so much as anticipation and photography, a tiger photography. What will they do next? You have no clue. So you've got to be sort of imagine if it's a leopard on a tree, you think he's going to move now. So you reset your time, your, your shutter speeds. You know, in, it's all anticipation and luck. It's all luck. You know, one, 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 two leaves blocking the eyes of an animal. You don't have a photograph. You know, there's nothing you can do. You can't move your face. You know, 
that's, that's yeah. why let's yeah. probably be it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think fascinating. Um, I'm sh I hope the organizers will pick up. Uh, I think uh, Tina had a YouTube link where you can uh, see a couple of yeah, shots. Plenty. Yeah, if you just go to, to Great Wild uh, Cats, Born to be Free, which is the title, uh, uh, you know, the pages have a QR code, but even then, it's all out on YouTube. So you can access the videos. Yeah. And I'm hoping the organizers also will have links, of course, on where to get the books. But this yeah. is a good uh, time, but I want to make sure that I hand over to Ambika also. Ambika, can you tell us about the book for the, uh, for the audiences? Again, we can't hear you. I know how sad. No. We are very brave, Harini. We are doing this over four states. I know, two four states. And that will debunk, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to be easy. Well, maybe she, I'm sure she'll come back in a minute. So, yes, she's already. Can we hear her now? No. Can you say something? Can you try again? No. I can see the book, but we can't hear you. Unfortunately, not. Maybe uh, Tina, if I can just ask you while while Ambika is getting this set up. So, yeah. a question, Tina and Babi, what has been your experience with the audiences that re resonate to this book? Because one part is, of course, you're showing this book, and I'm not talking about the wildlife photographers or wildlife enthusiasts who are looking at the book. You know, which right. is your natural audience who, who know about this. What has been your experience in converting the non-converted, so to speak, or to making people interested in the books? Um, uh, what I I think what has been absolutely fabulous is the younger generation, mm -hmm. which has just today I find that they they go out they spend the money you know the book uh, uh, Om is our publisher we are very grateful that they published the book and uh, it's come out turned out beautifully and I must say that the youngsters are also going out spending their money buying these books and taking more and more holidays in in wildlife um, in national parks more than going out to the cities it's not only the pandemic that has uh, wanted them uh, made them want to go out to open areas but they are very interested a lot of it is of course all the information we get today so and people, yes, people never realize. They think it's so simple. You go out there, you see an animal, you take a picture. The hours of waiting, you know, being there it takes years to be in the right place, the right time, getting that picture. So people who don't know the jungle, don't understand it, don't see that. And of course, there are people who say, oh, very nice book. Look at the cover, turn one page and put it down. So it is always, it is still a very niche uh, place. You know, you have to be interested. It's not just something that looks good on your table, you know. And yet there are people who have gone through every page, noticed every detail. I suppose it will still take some time. But yes, the youngsters, I find, are getting more and more interested, which is wonderful. So, Great. I, I was especially, for me, what struck, it was, I, I can't remember the page, but the, one of the pages where you have a lizard with a, with a mottled background. That's and, right. 
And, he, and accidentally, he, he was so beautiful, he accidentally made his way into this book. You know, the photographer right. couldn't let anything, which didn't look like a big wild cat to be in there. But he even he relented. He said, okay, you can have him. Give him a page kind of thing. You know, <laughs> it was it was a monitor lizard basking in the sun in Sri Lanka. Yes, and Yala. It's in the sense that, you know, the, the forest is an ecosystem. There's everything. And the tiger is not going to thrive unless the rest of the forest. No, is not at all. Not at all. But yeah, not at all. It is, you know, head of the chain. But definitely. And yes, because of the tiger, we have learned so much about the smaller things, the plants, the trees. You know, you sit there, you're looking, waiting for this big cat to arrive. Or oh, even in Africa, there's so many different species you pick up on, you learn about. Fascinating trivia that you pick that you would never find in a textbook that you find when you're on the field. You know, you want to tell them about the zebra? About the zebra, how a zebra mother? I mean, it's how a zebra mother has a foal, and then she will take take her take her her, her foal away so that her stripes are imprinted on the foal's memory before she will bring him back into the herd. You know, there are so many different uh, things. How all the impala will will drop their babies just before the rain so they have enough food. I mean, it's you learn so much about so many different things because you're pursuing the big the big cat, you know, the royalty. So yes. And where, 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 since she's not on, on the on the screen, uh, all the, the people, people I would love to ask her that. Let's see if she, we can get her to speak before her line goes off. Yeah. Ambika, you're back. Can we are you able to speak? No. Unfortunately, is, not. Unfortunately, because there is a field of work that she's doing. Yeah, it is a very fascinating book, and I wish that you could so hear that. that. Hopefully, and we still you know, uh, have a huge lobby of, of, of uh, human rights and tribal rights activists who are so against what the Supreme Court uh, said about removing all the villages and all from the uh, jungle. Uh, and there's a huge lobby there. And there's a lot of us who are so insanely possessive about the wildlife. And we see that over generations, that the, the, the I don't like to use the Bible, but let's say the indigenous people uh, are not as, um, you know, they're now so impregnated with city people. And so they, 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 they do have access to resources uh, other than the traditional resources. From uh, in the jungle, and then they are also getting quite. You know, they used to be the custodians of the of the jungle and the tigers and all that. And uh, now, you, you know, there's poaching. There's all this stuff that is happening. So I would have loved to have a long, detailed uh, listen to her point of view on this. I myself have very conflicting, um, exactly. opinions on things. I think so. Maybe I will do a quick summary of the book since Ambika yeah. is unable to. Uh, so Ambika's book, uh, which I think everybody should definitely read, is Tigers Are Our Brothers. And uh, it's a book which is uh, published by Oxford University Press. It's based on Ambika's uh, you know, very detailed work with uh, the bums in, um, uh, in the... Uh, so let me just see if I can just read Hi, out. Can, can, you hear, can, you hear, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I can hear you perfectly. Can just you hear me time. now? Yes, yes. So Ambika, the floor me. is yours. No? Hi, Harini. Hi. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what is the problem. Um, I, I can hear you. I can hear you and I can see you all, but I'm not able to, you're not able to hear me. I don't know what is the problem. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. If we can hear no. you. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Please continue. Please continue. Yeah. So, no, go ahead, Ambika. We can hear you. Please talk. Hello. 
now? Yes. Yeah, not able to hear you, Amrika. Sorry. Again, we have this, the connection is really bad. I'm wondering if I should just take over and just do a quick summary of the book. I obviously won't be able to do it the way you do it, but maybe I can just something for okay. the audience. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so based on the PhD anthropological work and uh, the book. And I have done uh, uh, the entire field work in uh, the Bang Valley and Bang Valley, a group of individuals called Idu Mishmis. In fact, I presented my book. Uh, we had a book discussion here with the Idu Mishmis, and we had a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, the book tells us how different groups of actors at the center of the screen and look at how the state understands conservation and how the science and wildlife biologists understand conservation and how do indigenous groups see these animals and and what i found is i wanted to include the uh, local indigenous really part of any scientific management uh, practices and when people say that the kinship with animals this is very fascinating we all have human connections with Oh. Yeah, so let me continue with this. Uh, so this is based on Ambika's uh, long-term ethnographic PhD thesis research from the National University of Singapore. And she mainly worked in the Dibang Valley as well as other parts of Arunachal Pradesh, where the Idu Mishimi uh, indigenous communities protect the tiger, but protect the tiger because they say the tiger is their brother. And so she starts with this whole discussion of how she went in to do some wildlife research and human animal conflict of the tribe with the with the tiger with the tiger and and with other wildlife researchers. And she saw that other wildlife researchers were being uh, very hostile. They had to face hostile questioning from this indigenous community of why do you need to come and tell us that you need to protect the tiger or tell us that if you don't protect the tiger, the deer will increase. Therefore, your agriculture will be run overrun, etc. We've always protected the tiger. the tiger. The tiger is our brother. And then she proceeds to do this very long discussion in after spending years in this landscape, talking about how the larger threats are something, and that I think is something we, which I think all of you will agree with, is the larger threats are something we should unite about. The larger threats are more like large dam construction, large roads and other infrastructure projects that cut through these protected areas. The overall growth of cities at the fringes of all our protected areas, the mining of these protected areas for coal, for different kinds of minerals, for gems in different parts of the world, not necessarily oh, India. Right? And when we when we stop and talk about resettlement of communities and expansions of protected areas, we're often losing a lot in terms of not uniting to, to tackle the larger threats, which is this larger development narrative that of course we need, but which really then destroys our, um, you know, the last few pockets where people and wildlife can actually live together. And in this context, I should say that, you know, one of the best places that I have seen, of course, in East Africa, you have wonderful places where the Maasai and are involved in community conservation. Yes. But there's also excellent work in Nepal at the fringes of the Chitwan National Park, where I yes. have personally seen over 20 years of work, how communities at the fringe of the Chitwan National Park actually have in some sense, better wildlife sightings and better uh, management of wildlife than areas within the park, even during the worst times of the Maoist insurgency and conflict, because communities were so closely involved with 
conservation and the economic benefits from that kind of tourism. Right. I think you're so right. I think what has happened to all our communities is that we are not giving them enough. We are, and they're so poor, you know, and so they depend on on we just and also what has been promised to them by state authorities and stuff they don't really get. So where are they going to go? You know, if and we have so much we what I certainly don't agree on is there are far too many uh, uh, hotels and things like that that are coming up in all these wildlife places. You know, too much. I mean, Corbett has weddings happening over there you know things like that so so all these people who have made so much money because of the wildlife are not giving back to the community enough if they give it back give back to the local community maybe they won't depend on the on the forest so much maybe they will not um, have to resort to you know hunting the prey base as much as they do or giving into poaching deals or things like that i just don't think that they are we need to really look at them uh, because they are the link they are they really they are the link between you know the all of us today and 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 the forest isn't absolutely. it absolutely so we're now at the last two minutes i'll just ask you both maybe babi and then tina any closing words any closing please words. Repeat. What, closing any? words any closing any, words any at closing the last minute. i can only say please look at this book uh, because it's a pictorial, it's fabulous. Even if you don't want to read about uh, what you know tigers do and what conservation is all about, at least let it let the pictures inspire you. Let the pictures inspire you. Do what you can. Do what you can for for nature. You'll help the environment. You know, reduce your carbon footprint. And uh, well, please please look at this book. It's 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 a it's a labor of love. There's lots of time and energy spent into it. I hope you appreciate it. Great. Go and see the book, Magnificent Planet and the Planet. <laughs> right. Go and and uh, since Amrita is not here, it, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Babi. I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Sorry? She's saying go ahead. You were saying something. No, no. I was saying go and see the most magnificent predator on planet Earth. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, uh, while know. you're at it, I think also... Uh, when we look at protected areas, I think it's I, what Ambika's book also tells us is we should also look at these as embedded in a forest where often indigenous communities live. And yes. so one part of this is to get to know the indigenous communities that live with these and how do they interact with the, with this wildlife. Yes. And respect, just respect, respect what we have, especially Absolutely. in our country, just respect. And for the younger generation more than anything else. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank with you. that, thank you very much, Tina and Babi. And thank you so much, Ambika, for persisting despite the yeah. bad connection. Yeah. It's really unfortunate that we couldn't hear more from her. because and So I, I urge you all to go out and get both of these fabulous books and read them and spread the word about this. They have very different perspectives into the large cat and all kinds of large cats in, in the case of Babi and Tina's book, but in the, specifically the tiger in case of Ambika's. And both are really worth you know viewing, reading and spending time with. Yeah. So with that, I'll thank the organizers very much and I'll hand it over back to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you, Pune International Literary Festival. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ambika Ayodurai, Mr. Babi Nobis, Ms. Tina Nobis, and Ms. Harini Nagendra for being PILF guests. We will begin our next session after a short break of 15 minutes. Please join us for successful conversations Masterclass with Raju Parulekar at 3 p.m.